from Provo, Utah, this is the Ultimate Final Fantasy Podcast with your hosts, Joseph DeGolier and Caleb Schweiss. This is Ultima Final Fantasy. Welcome to another episode of Ultima Final Fantasy, the ultimate Final Fantasy podcast. I am Joe. I'm Caleb. And today we're going to be talking about the Squall is Dead theory. Now, I know what you're thinking. Another podcast already talked about Squall is Dead. But here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we forget about that podcast and uh, just focus on ours. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a really cool kind of theory and... You know, we'd like to touch on it on our show. It doesn't matter if another show already talked about it. Yeah, plus we talked about talking about it before they talked about it. That's true. If you if you have listened to every single one of our episodes and you like lined up the dates, you will know that we were planning a Squall is, a- a Squall is Dead episode uh, after we were done with Final Fantasy VIII, which we mm-hmm. finished Final Fantasy VIII, and uh, so now we're going to talk about the Squall is Dead theory. It's true. It's true. Hey, uh, do we have any new iTunes reviews this week, Caleb? Oh, actually, oh no, we don't. No? All right, guys, it's been like four weeks. It's been a without, while without an iTunes review, so you know you gotta give us the you gotta give us the goods. Give us the love. <laughs> if, there's, if there's anything we ask of you, it is if you haven't given us an iTunes review and you have iTunes or the podcast app, please uh, go on and give us a review and a rating. Which is, of course, five. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Schweiss. Well, uh, is there anything else in particular we want to talk about before we delve right into it? Mm. Oh, wait. Yes, there is. What There's is a little that? thing. It's about, our, it's about our podcast. So right now, we're in the middle of disc two on Final Fantasy IX. As we're talking here, it is Saturday. You guys are going to get this episode on Monday. Um, so if you're playing along with us... By Monday, we will be on disc three of Final Fantasy IX. Yeah. And we're planning on beating Final Fantasy IX by February 7th. So, if you guys are playing with us, we're pretty far ahead right now. So, you guys got to catch up. Yeah. I don't yeah. have anything else yeah. to add yeah. to okay. that. Well, unless, well, we're ahead of them unless they started before us. That's, that's true. Unless they started before us. I just saw a thread on on our forum that was talking about, hey, I'm playing along, right? And I was like, ooh, we're pretty... We are really trying to race through nine. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I say race through nine. We gave us we gave, we gave ourselves a one-month um, time period to beat nine. Yeah, it's not really racing through necessarily, but no. it is It is structured to some, to some point. So. It's true, yeah. We're trying to do one disc a week. Yeah, so. which is... A little heavy in the beginning because normally the last disc of these games is like the final dungeon and that's it for the most part usually what i'm gonna try to do i can't remember if you can go back and do other stuff at the uh, during disc four and i'm so i'm gonna have to look that up um if you can't then that's when i'll look around see if there's any good extra stuff to do and then yeah just go for it all right um another thing is we have finally decided to play Final Fantasy XI after Final Fantasy X. And so, in order to have a good group of people, hopefully, if not, it might just be me and Schweiss playing every night. Um, <clears throat> after we're done with Final Fantasy X, we're going to give ourselves two months to play Final Fantasy X after Final Fantasy IX. Mm-hmm. It might be a little faster than that, uh, depending on how we play it. We're, we'll see. Uh, after Final Fantasy X, we're going to give ourselves two months to beat the Bastok missions of Final Fantasy XI. Uh... And so, if you guys want to join us, we're going to try to structure it so that 9 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, every night, we're going to be on Final Fantasy XI until we defeat the Bastok missions. And thus, we'll have a review of the main storyline of Final Fantasy XI. Yeah, and I mean, we... I know we released on our list that we'll do the... Well, we released the expansions on the list of games that we're going to play, but that's just kind of up in the air based on how we feel about Eleven. But, you know, I'm hopeful. It is a big moneymaker for Square, so... Yeah, that's true. I think it's their biggest moneymaker ever. 
Yeah. Is 11. Yeah. Probably. 14 will probably surpass it because... Hopefully. <laughs> not just Final Fantasy fans play 14. There's tons of people. Like at that convention, there's so many people that didn't care about the rest of the series. Well, here's here's what I think is doable about it. First off, they if you have all the expansions for Final Fantasy 11, they have dwarfed the game from maybe the last time you played it back in 2004 or something. Uh, it's super... It's really quick to level up in Final Fantasy XI, which is good, because you got to be like level 75 in order to do the last Bastok mission. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's really what we're going for. What was the average? We got to level up at least like 1.14 times per day. Yeah, it was and, that or... And then do one mission, one main storyline mission every three days. Yeah. In order to get Final Fantasy XI done in two months. And... Unfortunately, there's not that much information as far as like how long this will take. There's no Let's Plays that actually go through all the Bastok missions. So, we need to find out yeah. <laughs> how doable it really is. Yeah, and as you mentioned before, I don't really think anyone else really does that. They don't get down, sit down with an MMO and be like, alright, I'm going to beat the story, and that's it. <laughs> that's true. It'll be like, it's like we're breaking new ground here. It's like... Yeah. Let's beat the main story of the first part of Final Fantasy XI. So no mm-hmm. expansions. The main story. We'll we'll just do the Bastok missions. There's there's three there's three main stories that you can do. Like depending on where you start in eleven, and we'll both start at Bastok. Yeah, it seems to be the most popular place to start. Yeah. Plus, I don't want to be. I don't know, I'm kind of want to do a Let's Play, and it would be pretty lame if it was just my character for like the first week, and then right. we met up. So, so I'm thinking you'd be a black mage, I'll be a white mage, and if you guys out there, we're obviously going to be looking for a tank and damage. Yeah, physical damage. So, at least yeah. I assume that's how the game is played. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's what we thought for one, and it was disgusting when you did it that way. So. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> two warriors, two red mages. That's yeah, what I say. that was still disgusting for me. But <laughs> all right, so that's our podcast news. We will be going on to Final Fantasy XI and having a review on that. We're not going to be forever on Final Fantasy XI. We're going to take as much time on eleven as we will on ten and twelve and thirteen because yeah. they are they after nine the games get long, and so the time that it takes is going to get a little longer. Yeah. So, but we're still going to do weekly episodes, including this one, Schweiz. Mm-hmm. Let's get to it. This is a this is a discussion, but it's also a did you know? Yeah, so. it was submitted. So <laughs> yeah. News, news, news. <laughs> you thought we were gonna skip news? Yeah, so didn't did I. You? Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I remembered right at the last minute. We got. A tiny, tiny bit of news. Oh, sweet. Uh, to tell you guys about. The so, first piece of news, Schweiss, take it away. So, uh, yeah, Final Fantasy Type-0 is going to have an M rating. I know we talked about this before. Is this the first Final Fantasy to have an M rating? Yep, it is. It They're is all... a glorious day. I know. I <laughs> am excited for it. And mostly, I really, I hope to God that this game looks amazing because it's not going to be the only thing I have on PS4 for a little while, unless I do get a bundle with Destiny or something in it. So I hope it doesn't look like a port. Because this, I, well, if there's actually footage out there that compares the two, it's look um, much better. It does look much better. It doesn't look like a PS4 game. Yeah. But it does look a lot better okay. than it did before. Well, I feel a little better about spending, what was it, like $108 on yeah, it? Yeah, we both pre-ordered it. Um, so if you guys, I think there's a contest going on on Twitter. If you guys want to like try your chance at getting Final Fantasy Type-0 and a special PS4. without paying for it. <laughs> yeah. But we already pre-ordered it, so it's like, well, fuck the little Twitter battle that they're having. Yeah, so, so, did, uh, so did Caleb Craig. So if you're interested in that... Caleb Gray, really? Did he? Yeah, he pre-ordered okay. Type-0. Man, he's just hell-bent on he, being every, on every single episode of this podcast. Isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. So, if you guys are interested in that, go check that out. I don't have the rules or anything in front of me right now. No, we decided to ignore it. Yeah. Because we already have the game. Okay, our next uh, little piece of news here is that Hajime Tabata confirmed that players won't be able to drive 
in the first playable demo, playable demo of the game. So that car that we've been seeing footage of over and over again, it's not going to be in the demo. God Or at least our ability to drive it. So, uh, fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really hoping that doesn't mean it's like tens where you don't actually drive it ever, but I kind of doubt that. Well, he it just would... said it, you can't drive it in the demo. Right, I know. Which would, I guess, Specifically imply, the demo. Yeah, it would imply that it's in the game. It does imply that you do drive it. Yeah. So that's awesome. That's good, yeah. Dude, I wonder if there's going to be, like, car races, like, chases and stuff. Maybe. It turns into, like, uh... Grand Theft Auto a little bit. Or Need for Speed, where you have to break stuff and, like, drop it on the cops. <laughs> <laughs> and destroy them as I they're chasing doubt you. I that. Something be tells me that's not going to happen. What would be sweet is if you were the only one that had a car and everyone else was, like, chasing you on Chocobo or whatever. <laughs> So, yeah, like, what is this new machine? Yeah, 10,000 chocobo power, <laughs> I guess. Instead of horsepower? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be sweet if they like you went in to buy the car and it had that as its stats. 1,000 chocobo. <laughs> All right, man. Our last piece of news is remember patch 2.5 that we went over last last time we had news? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh Part one of that, patch 2.5, Before the Fall, has been released. Ooh. And I do believe this is the, um, this is the, uh, like, uh, man, what am I thinking of? The Gold Saucer. I think that's part of this patch. I think so, too, yeah. So. That's cool. For you guys playing 14, uh, get on that. Get on that new stuff. Yeah, and you know, I honestly do want to kind of play that, uh, triple triad that they have going on at least in really in, well I thought you hated triple triad hate that one and i really don't like the one in nine either at least the triple triad i understand the one in nine it's like no i win and uh i'm taking this i'm like uh it's kind of <laughs> like when i'm playing a fighting game caleb craig for the first time and he just like kicks the shit out of me relentlessly except for i lose stuff actual things <laughs> so I'm it's sorry. it's worse yeah i'm so sorry i haven't played any of it Dude, I don't understand. I don't. I don't get it. And I'm not like, yet. I don't really want to get it either. So I guess. Wait. When did you play the card game? Because I never had to. I just. I didn't have to. I just tried it. Oh, you just. I tried just walked it? up to somebody, pressed square, and they're like, "Oh, cards." I'm like, <laughs> mm, "I'll try it once," and then I did. Is there like a symbol, like in in the game? Do you like give them a secret handshake or something? They're like, "Oh, okay, I get it." Probably. Time. What's funny is uh, there was this guard walking around and. The beginning of disc two, it's that, I can't remember what the town name is, but it's the one where you can give those little tokens to that lady and get special items. Um, and Treno? I think so. Yeah. There's a guard walking around and he's like, I have nothing to say to filth like you or something like that. And then I press square on him and he's like, oh, you want to play cards? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, so you won't talk to me because I'm a scoundrel, but you'll play cards with me? <laughs> what? What is this? This is Blaze. That's hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Troyes. Let's get to our uh, our discussion. A did you know? Rather. Ooh. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know, my friend? All this cool shit. Sick origins of Final Fantasy. And another stuff you might not have known. But maybe you know, but that's okay. We're still going to do a segment called Did You Know? Alright, so this Did You Know slash discussion. Um, although we were talking about doing it before, um, we do have a forum member that posted this as a Did You Know? Mm-hmm. Or as a possible Did You Know? Uh, because it is just a theory. Anyway, it's FF8 Squall's Dead Theory. This comes from Void, who is now level 99. So he's had over 99 posts. Way to go, Void. Uh, I saw another forum member's post about the Renoa slash Ultimacia theory, which uh, we might be talking about next week, uh, and I thought I would bring up the Squall is dead theory. Basically, the premise is that Squall dies at the end of Disc 1 during the assassination attempt when the sorceress impales him with a giant icicle. And, of course, that ends the disc. I, mm-hmm. yes. uh, there's a lot of interest interesting evidence uh, to back this up, especially the way some of the imagery is handled in the final cutscenes of the game. All of the info about it can be found at squallsdead.com, uh, which we do have pulled up, I, I do believe. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So this Squall's Dead Theory webpage, uh, it's by Rahul Chowdhury and Deidre Ratter, or Raider. Probably Raider. Uh, and they say it's based on an idea by Duckroll. 
which I assume is an avatar name from someone somewhere in the <laughs> yeah. internet. <laughs> I'm sorry, Duck Roll, if you're listening. I, I don't know who you are. Yeah. But... Um, so this is their theory, and, and we're going to kind of read through this. I feel like podcast listeners are probably not the biggest readers of all time. Now, I, I do say that with, like, <laughs> a small, you know, a small chuckle. But, uh, you know, I listen to a lot more podcasts than I read. Yeah. So I'm just guessing that maybe the people listening to our podcast have not read The, the Squall is Dead Theory. So we're actually going to try to get through the whole thing today. Mm-hmm. While discussing it at the yeah, same while time. While discussing it, yes. And then we also have a rebuttal. Want me to go we'll, for it? Which we'll go through. The Theory. This is what they say. Mm-hmm. At the end of disc one, Squall and friends face Adia in a parade float in Delling City. After the fight, when Adia seems defeated, she conjures an enormous icicle shard and propels it through Squall's chest. Squall stumbles back and falls off the platform. He sees Renoa above, reaching for him as he falls. Squall closes his eyes and dies. The entire remaining game time, from the beginning of disc two to the second half of the ending movie, is a dream. The second half of the ending movie, huh? Yeah. Could have so, just said the rest of the game. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to what they think happens at, at the ending movie. And uh, uh, we'll get, you know, we'll talk about that. That's right at the end. So, supporting evidence, Schweiss. You've become just a memory. Right. In the latter half of Disc 1, two conversations take place concerning Cypher's fate and if he will be executed for attacking the president of Galbadia. During these sections of dialogue, Squall muses to himself Hmm. on the existential qualities of death. Will they talk about me this way if I die too? Uh, Squall was... What? Squall was this and that? Squall was this and that. That's a oh, okay. Squall was this and that. Okay. (laughs) Using the past tense, saying whatever they want... So this is what death is all about. Do you remember that part of the game? Yeah, I do. Okay. That's the part where Squall just kind of runs out and then you go on the mission anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird. In this manner, Squall considers his own death and what little difference it will make for the world. It's true. This (laughs) sense serves as foreboding and ominous suggestion to the viewer that ill times are ahead. Also note the excerpt from the first conversation concerning Cypher's possible execution. Think what you want. Reality isn't so kind. Everything doesn't work out the way you want it to. That's why. As long as you don't get your hopes up, you can take anything. You feel less pain. Anyway, whatever wish you have is none of my business. Here Squall states the obvious. Shit happens. People die. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way the world is. Everything doesn't work out the way you want it to. Not only in this, not only is this foreshadowing... Hmm. But it's also contrary to what some consider a central theme to Final Fantasy VIII's story. Fate. So, they're suggesting that this is when the writers are possibly foreshadowing Squall's death. After Cypher's ex- possible ex- execution. Mm-hmm. Right. That's And that's interesting. I'm not sure if that's really a point, but uh, yeah. here we go to our probably the biggest... The biggest thing about this whole whole uh, theory. Yeah. No the... wound? Really? No wound? Mm-hmm. The attempted assassination of Adia by Seed at Delling City at the end of Disc 1 is where everything starts and ends, according to this theory. Dun, dun, dun. Squall engages Adia and Cypher in battle on the parade float. After the battle ends, Adia casts a spell on him. You got a spell After on After the you. counter... <laughs> After the encounter between Squall and Adia, Squall wakes up in a cell in the Galbadian Desert prison. His first dialogue is... Where am I? I challenged Adia. My wound. No wound. No life. How? Anywhere. The Galbadian soldiers. We were surrounded. Space. He was there. The final frontier. Seifer, leering down at me. Damn you, Seifer! Apparently, Squall's healthy and good to go. Yeah. That bugged the shit out of me. Yeah, me too. I was like, uh... I don't know if we talked about this during the during our review of Final Fantasy VIII. Just the impaled icicle, and then Squall is just fine. I don't think we did. Maybe we knew. Maybe we knew that this theory was right. Maybe. Well, I think he's confused that he doesn't have a scar. I think that's part of this, right? Yeah, he's confused. Yeah. 
apparently Squall's healthy and good to go. And it never again referenced directly. It's never again referenced directly in the entire game. Nor is it ever explained what happened to his wound or how he survived. And remember, a piece of ice half as long as Squall himself went through his chest and came out the other side. True. This is no mere scratch that is so careless, carelessly tossed aside. Most players seem to assume that Adia healed Squall to full health for the purpose of interrogation. Why would they assume Most that? Play- I never assumed that. I didn't assume shit. I was just like, oh, okay. Maybe, maybe that's a way to fill in the plot hole. <laughs> yeah, with like well, cement. Uh, Cypher knows that Squall is no great captain from Belong Garden. He's no more privy to top secret information than are the other three. If Adia, and that's not true, if Adia <laughs> wanted to know more about Seed, she should just be in- interrogating Quistus, who's been a Seed for three years and who has been teaching Seeds for one year. Squall has been a Seed for all of two weeks. This is true. Mm-hmm. This is a good point. Why go through all that effort of killing him just to bring him to full health when he obvious- when he's obviously a threat to her? I know, I, I feel like I agree with that point because... At this point in the game, Squall doesn't really know that much about what's going on. He doesn't know He doesn't know anything, really. He well, just knows they're being sent on these missions because they're mercenaries, but he doesn't understand what he learns later in the game about the motivations, anything I, like that. I agree with that. Part of that paragraph's point <laughs> was that Cypher knew that they didn't know anything, and I don't think that's true. I think Cypher... I th- I do believe that Cipher was kind of freaking out and and thinking that they were told some secret information and yeah because yeah. the sorceress made it seem like they they really needed Squall and Co you right. know captured so I guess I, I I see where that would be obviously Cipher wouldn't just you know say that shit if he didn't actually think that they had info right so yeah I I don't agree with that part of contradictory that. yeah um three. I don't know what's going on anymore. As some of you may have noticed, the plot takes a few unanticipated turns after the end of disc one. At first, the transition is rather, rather, is sorry, rather subtle. Rather subtle. <laughs> when plot twists are introduced, they are fully explained and are not in conflict with existing plot information. In fact, the more you learn about this world, the more everything seems to make perfect sense. Everything fits together in an elaborate but perfectly designed puzzle. Everything connects, and everything is related. And yet, it still seems absolutely ridiculous. I feel like that's an opinion. Yeah. Yeah. An opinion I share, but... Yeah. Can... The story takes on a dreamlike Maybe quality. Maybe not that everything connects, but whatever. No, I don't... Freaking, like, nothing. I... <laughs> the story takes on a dreamlike quality that centers itself on Squall and everything Squall has ever wanted. The dream goes on to explain everything Squall wanted to know... But it also treads through the realm of egoist fantasy. It spins off into a world of impossible where monsters come from the moon and Squall, merely a newly recruited cadet, goes on to save our world as we know it from an evil sorceress from the future. And he gets the girl. Let's look at some specific examples. This first example here is Moombas. As soon as I saw those red lion Pokemons running around on the screen, I knew there was something strange happening. I keep saying he as the writer, but there's two writers here, and I don't know their gender, but I'm just going to keep using he. I'm going to reference this, okay? Uh, Just for the audience out there. Uh, The first disc had a fairly high level of realism, despite the fantasy and low sci-fi topics present. The characters were all human, the, and the outside of monst- and outside of monsters, there were no unearthly creatures to be seen. That's a lot of unearthly creatures. Those monsters. So it's true. I disagree with him. Uh, Renoa had a dog that attacks for her at times, as earthly dogs are known to do. But they aren't usually shot from your arm. No, I don't think that would be okay. No, nowadays. <laughs> But there weren't any fluffy feline creatures running around yelling Laguna Laguna. Of course, Moombas are explained within the context of the game. In the Shuni village, you can learn who the Moombas are, who they evolve from, and so on and so forth. The game takes the plot developments of the dream very seriously and treats them all as truth, which makes the dream theory especially difficult to argue. Sure, all this stuff seems weird, but how do we know that it's all intended to be a dream? Maybe the creators just thought it'd be cool to have talking cats around which i i think is the case but <laughs> yeah. and who knows maybe they did but i think it's more than a con- than con- than convenient that the more 
Fantastical elements such as talking lions do not appear in the game until after the moment where Squall may have died. That's that's yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I think the next his next uh, thing is Norg here. Fushururu. <laughs> Three <laughs> seconds are up. Okay, we already covered the Moombas and the Shumi, but I still wanted to say, what the fuck? The Master of Garden is a giant yellow sloth alien creature? You gotta be kidding me. I don't know about you guys, but this is typical dream material in my opinion. Of course, Norg and his kind are fully explained in the game if you take the time to seek the information they present, but there are no hints presented in the story to suggest the sort of twist was coming. When walking around Garden in the beginning of the game, you often see the cult-looking guys in red robes wandering about and sometimes conversing with you briefly. I more than once thought they looked a bit creepy, though. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. And I can easily imagine that Squall would have thought the same and inter- integrated their possible backstory into his dream. Hmm. Yeah, that's... Right. <laughs> okay. Not only is there no evidence leading up to this discovery, after Squall and friends kill Norg, that's it. Norg. Nothing happens. Squall speaks to Sid, but he doesn't even talk about it. I expected him to at least say, oh, by the way, Sid, I just killed that big slimy dude that was hanging around in the basement, yelling orders and acting all powerful and stuff. Hope that's no prob. There's no retaliation, no consequences. Consequences. Not quenches either, though. <laughs> Nothing. The story goes on as if Norg had never come into it. Also, in the Norg section, another little twist comes to the surface. Sid and Nadia are married. Spoiler! It's another (laughs) typical twist. The only important older male character and the only important older female character are married and have a backstory that goes back decades. And, like Norg, it comes completely out of left field. The twist does not conflict with existing story information, yet it seems so out of place and unrealistic. It really, really does. It does. It's like inhumanly out of place. I think it's less on purpose and more more just bad writing, honestly. Uh, (laughs) That's the problem I have. No clue towards it at all. Kind of like the twist where they were all in the same orphanage as kids. Yeah. That's stupid. Those kind of twists. <laughs> they're they're they like yeah, they're weak plot yeah. lines, and I agree up to this point with the theory. Yeah. Or without with not with the theory because I don't know. I, I do think it's just weak storytelling. I think so too, but we'll, we'll see. keep going. Yeah. See, perhaps it's fate, and we're back to the fate question. What I wanted to point out on the subject of fate and destiny and all that hubbubaloo, hullabaloo. Sorry, <laughs> hubbubaloo. It's simply this. The subject of fate does not come up until after the end of disc one. The word fate comes up only once on the first disc when Swall and friends get the la- get on the last train for Delling City moments before it disembarks. Uh, Irvine comments on the luck by saying, hmm, perhaps fate. After the first disc of the game, however, fate becomes a frequent subject of conversation. It's Seed's destiny to defeat the sorcerers, Squall's fate to lead guard, and Squall is destined to face Cypher, etc. Fate becomes such a prevalent topic that many players come away feeling that fate was one of the most important elements of Final Fantasy VIII's story, and the answer to all questions. Fate is the reason why this lowly cadet instantaneously becomes the leader of Garden. Fate is the reason why everyone in your party apparently knew each other as children. Fate is the reason why (laughs) everything falls into place like a perfect fantasy. I'm going to have to say Ultima Junction to your attack is why everything happened. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Even before Ultima was was junctioned, that is what made you become the god. <laughs> Not fate. Squall went out and got Ultima. He shall be our leader. Yes. yes. <laughs> he discovered it in a village next to a man sitting down <laughs> who apparently didn't know it was there. I think Island of Heaven and Hell is just... What, no, wait, yeah, in the village there was Ultima. You could draw that. Never yeah, mind. in Fisherman's Horizon. That's right. in a, all right, just stay close to me. Okay, Caleb. Is yeah. Anything else you want to say or just, just get nice? Just get like, cozy here. Right. It's kind of chilly. Speaking of a perfect fantasy, the romantic storyline of FF8 is just that. The romantic plotline, which many fans consider to be the most successful element of the game, is completely fabricated for Squall's personal satisfaction. 
Not only does Renoa show little appreciation for Squall through Disc 1, but there are many allusions to her ongoing relationship with Cypher. Their relationship appears to be to have been on a sort of hiatus when Cypher was studying at the Balam Garden, but their affection and romantic connection is still in place when the story occurs, when this story occurs. In the ballroom scene, which is an awesome scene, Renoa flirts with Squall casually, but appears to take no actual interest in him as an individual. She tells him honestly, as she drags him out to dance, that she's waiting for someone else. And then there's the dialogue. After a quick dance and a swoon from the female fans, Renoa wordlessly brushes him off and leaves to find Cypher. Her abruptness suggests that her real interest lies elsewhere. The Stupid next time, bitch. yeah, the next time Squall <laughs> sees Renoa, it's in Timber. Renoa is overjoyed to see him, but only because he's a member of Seed. Here we also learn that Renoa knows Cipher from the party and from before. Her demeanor suggests a fondness for him that she does not let go of. After the events of Timber, when the party discusses Cipher's execution, Renoa speaks more openly on her relationship with Cipher. I really liked him. He was always full of confidence, smart. Just by talking to him, I felt like I could take on the world. Your boyfriend? I really don't know. I I think it was love. I wonder how he felt. Do you still like him? If I didn't, I wouldn't be talking about it. It was last summer. I was 16. Lots of fond memories. Oh. <laughs> God. Uh. <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland in... Renoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's that's who I am reminded of when I see Cypher. And the he movie would be Renoa. Cypher and Kiefer, you know? So it'd be Cypher and Kiefer. Cypher and Kiefer, yeah. Ke- <laughs> Kiefer as Cypher. Yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Firstly, Come Renoa here, is... So. Yeah. <laughs> Come here, Squallow. <laughs> Where is it? The seeds. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck are they? <laughs> Damn it. I don't think I've ever heard him say fuck. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. Firstly, Renoa oh, is... Oh, it's like eight seasons of 24, man. Oh, uh, they <laughs> wouldn't have sworn on 24 like no, that. No, he says damn it like every other word. Damn it. Damn it. I think you can go on YouTube and find like a, a collection of all the damn it's from 24. It's wow. like 12 minutes long. I, I kind of wish that you could replace like 10 damn it's with an F-bomb on TV and like they allowed that. Uh, certain television stations allow it at certain times. It's true. I'm not sure what the FCC guidelines are, but yeah, whatever. All right. So, first, Renoa is obviously quite taken with Seifer, and though she doesn't classify herself as his girlfriend, she admits she thinks it may be love. This is not a good beginning yeah, to a love no. story for Squall and <laughs> Renoa. Secondly, Renoa appears to fully dislike Squall's cold and introvert personality. She calls him mean, callous, and sensitive, and chastises him for not communicating his thoughts to her and the others in the party. That sounds a lot like me. Renoa does not show Squall the least bit of affection until the end of Disc 1 when Squall and Irvine save her from some strange iguana creatures. In this scene, she clutches Squall's arm shamelessly in her traumatized state. I was scared. Really scared. It's over now. I was scared. I was really, really scared. You, I know. You used to, you're not used to battles, are you? I couldn't. I just, I just couldn't. I couldn't fight alone. You're not ready for all this, this, this. Better get going. I haven't forgotten your order. Just stay close to me. A few moments later, at the sniper position, Squall considers oh, yeah. the possibility. That's my favorite position. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I just imagined it. It's pretty sweet in my mind. <laughs> Squall considers the possibility that he may have to fight Seifer as an enemy. He mentions the possibility to Renoa, who obviously may be heavily affected by Squall trying to kill her romantic interest. Renoa, Seifer's alive. He was in the parade with the sorceress. What does it mean? Who knows? If I were to face the sorceress directly, would I have to go through Seifer? Seifer? I may end up killing Seifer. <laughs> You're both prepared, right? That's the kind of world you live in. You've had a lot of emotional training, but of course, I'd rather it not happen. I mean, Squall's prepared. Seifer's not even a seed. Yeah, he couldn't. He hasn't made it to seed yet. Yeah, and I rocked him. Keeps going on these tests (laughs) and just failing. 
Yeah, he's probably just level grinding, which he doesn't like they can, realize. They never kick him out of the school. They're just like, yeah, stay here till you become a seed. Yeah. That's Maybe interesting. I think that's why Seifer's so weak is because he level grinds and uh, he makes Squall more powerful in the battles against sure, Squall. Yeah, because <laughs> Seifer's like level fifty. And, yeah. <laughs> all right, so Renoa appears to accept that if Seifer is protecting the sorceress, it is necessary to dispose of him. I think it's important to note that at this point in the game, at the end of Disc One, Squall is aware of Renoa's relationship with Seifer and does not seem threatened by it. Furthermore, Squall does not want to kill Seifer. Squall and Seifer have a history of quarrels and petty competition, but Seifer is still a comrade. In the final exam in Balaam, Squall and Bell work together with Seifer, despite their differences. The only reason to kill Seifer isn't his apparent alignment with the sorceress, is his apparent alignment. Which is never fully explained. That's true. He's just there. He was going to tell us his dream, or whatever, but he's he never a, his did. His romantic dream. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I don't fucking understand that at all. Like, I was like, what's the dream? That's like what I had at the end of 8. I was like, what was his dream? <laughs> so after disc 1, the complexity of the situation becomes much simpler. The relationship Renoa and Seifer had is never again mentioned, except by Seifer in the form of taunts during battle. Renoa herself seems to have completely distanced <laughs> herself from Seifer, and Seifer's enemy status is never again questioned. Seifer begins began as a rather complex character, an enemy at times to Squall and Zell, but is still a friend in battle. It's a douche. Yeah. He broke out of the garden's disciplinary wing to risk his life for Renoa, who found his courage inspiring. After disc one, he's a villain, and his only goal appears to be serving the sorceress. I personally expected Seifer to have been brainwashed or mind-controlled, and I spent a majority of the game waiting for Seifer to snap out of it and join Squall's team, but he never does. The story just accepts that Seifer is now evil and must be killed. It's so simple and, well, convenient. Seifer, who was Squall's personal tormentor and rival in school, has become a major villain to the world and all of his friends. And since Seifer is out of the way... is not out of the way... fuck... His would-be girlfriend, Renoa, is now single and apparently falling for Squall, though she never took an interest in him before. So, those are his non-end ideas as far as Squall is dead. Is that this stuff just doesn't seem to make sense. Mm -hmm. So, was it on purpose? Like I mean the re- the romance of course that that well romance in quotes it's really it's just a little love story that happens um, near the end of the game that it's all fabricated in Squall's head. You know that because Renoa really was cold to Squall and seemed to be interested in Cipher and for no apparent reason just flip the switch. Yeah, flips it over. That... Or is it maybe because Squall has saved her life so many times? <laughs> maybe maybe yeah, there's a little bit of something there or i don't know i don't know it is it is rather abrupt though like once disc one ends it's like boom well i think squall is interested in her there's a there's a scene where you go out um i think it's in disc two you take Renoa out to the, like the balcony of garden Mm-hmm. Where it's like open, and if you have Renoa in your party, there's like this scene where she's like, her hair is flowing in the wind, and Squall is like, hey. Like he looks at her, you know? At least mm-hmm. I assume that's what he's thinking. And uh, so I see the Squall angle, and maybe Squall liked her at the dance and was just acting cold because he's shy or something. Um, but Renoa's interest in Squall is kind of puzzling. Yeah, it really is. It's... Unless she like sees him as a project. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Maybe she's like you, you seem know, cold. You're a fixer upper. I will upper. change you. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's really the only way we can kind of make sense of it, right? Because it is so abrupt and just yeah. like, oh well. Maybe Squall is a fixer upper. They're an item. Well, I mean, she was into Cipher too. He's, yeah, he's definitely. He's a got fi- some serious problems. So. Yeah, maybe she's just a repair woman. Maybe of sorts. All right, so the, the final part of this theory, I, I do believe, is when he's talking about the end. You remember at the end after you'd fight. Ultimacia, the the dream sequence gets all crazy, right? Mm-hmm. All right, so let's let's read what he has to say here. At the very begin, at the very end of the game, just as you're beating the final boss, Ultimacia, she starts to say some strange things, statements that appear very 
out of context for a final battle. Reflect on your childhood, your sensation, your words, words, words. your emotions. Time, Time. it will not wait. wait. No matter how hard you hold on, it escapes you. When I read these words, a chill ran up my spine. With every attack, you bring down Ultimacia's hit points, and you bring Squall's dream to a close. Squall, oblivious, fights on, and only this fragment of his imagination seems aware of what is happening. Unless you had my party, in which case Squall was dead, and Zell finished the final battle. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's true. Theory debunked right there. <laughs> You could kill her with someone else. Beat him with Cell. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) There is a short story segment here involving Squall going back in time to the orphanage and seeing Ultimacy's pass on on her powers to Eden in the past. That's one of my favorite parts I hate. Uh, When Squall leaves in search of his own time and is shown wandering in a desert place. Uh, Then Squall leaves in search of his own time and is shown wandering in the desert place. Uh, he appears to be lost in time and unable to find his way back to a normal time period. Squall finds himself on a small rock island, isolated and helpless. He drops himself on the ground, exhausted. Then, upon catching a feather floating towards him like Forrest Gump, yeah. he finds himself where Renoa is. He calls out her name, and she turns to face him. This is where the sh- weird shit starts happening. I don't remember him calling out her name. Oh, yeah, he was like, Renoa, Renoa. Well, I, I was making fun of it because there's no voice. Well, the whole point is that they're supposed like... to remember their friends and their relationships, and so they won't get lost in the time vortex Compression. Yeah. yeah. Compression. Uh, the accents in 8, like her and then that... Uh, Norg? No, not Norg. The weird doctor guy, Dr. Irvine, is that what his name was? Dr. Irvine, yes. Or something, Dr. Something. Yeah, he was... Dr. Odin. Odin. His uh, accent made, like, no Dr. sense. Dr. Irvine. <laughs> I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'm a doctor and a sniper. Yeah, he comes in with, like... And a cowboy. And I'm Japanese. Yeah. And I'm totally not wearing anything <laughs> under this duster. Renoa turns to Squall, but her face is blurred. That is also one of the best parts of eight. I think, is this ending video. Except for the theme song bugs the shit out of me yeah there's a shot of cypher as the movie cuts to the ballroom scene here we see renoa again and again she turns towards the camera as she did in the ballroom scene on disc one but she's blurry and messed up the shot continues to repeat and every time renoa's face and form are blurred and the effect seems to be getting worse each time what is happening here it is my belief author of uh, squallsdead.com authors that as Squall's dream is coming to a close, he is starting to lose touch with his own memories. He is trying to picture Renoa, the object of his fantasy, but he can't quite remember the shape of her face. He is going over that moment in the ballroom when he first saw her again and again in his mind, focusing closer on her face and trying to see her the way she was. I have seen the specific visual symbol symbolism once before an eternal sunshine of the spotless mind have you seen that movie yeah it's really good yeah it is really good um the protagonist joel has his memories erased because he wants to forget his ex-girlfriend but in the course of the procedure joel realizes that what he's losing and tries to hold on to his precious memories he tries to remember the things that they have already erased just to find the characters in his memories are faceless blurred beyond recognition as squall is visualizing renoa in the bathroom or Ball in the ballroom. <laughs> God. Perfect. <laughs> in the ballroom, not in the bathroom, guys. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Fan fiction? Oh, no. <laughs> we start to see some quick shots interrupting the movie. The first one, as I already mentioned, was of Cypher. What is noteworthy about the shot of Cypher is that it shows him in the torchlight from the parade float where Adia tried to kill Squall with an ice... Ice spear. <laughs> Ice yeah. spell. There you go. <laughs> then some quick shots of Renoa appear. They are as blurred. Um, these are as blurred as the Renoa from the ballroom scene. The images of Renoa come from the scene where Adia makes her speech before the parade. Renoa, who appears to be under Adia's spell, follows the sorceress out to see the screaming crowd. 
we see some shots of Renault floating in space, and then we're back in the ballroom looking for Renault. Then there is another assortment of shots, and throughout the first disc of the game, first we see the uh, mechanical spider monster from the final exam in Balam, followed by shots of each of the party members but Squall. Quistus Cell, Renoa, Selfie, and Irvine, in that order. The image of Quistus Cell and Selfie are all from the final exam of Balam, and the shot of Irvine is from his introductory clip. Um, and then the O-Face shot of Renoa. Yeah. Oh! This frame was taken directly from the scene in which Squall was killed. So this is when Renoa is, like, turning as Squall is being impaled. Yeah. And then she reaches down towards him. Uh, we see some of the shots of Blom, uh communications tower, the Ragnarok, and there's a clip of Renoa still blurred with her hair in the wind. A shot of Cypher pushing Renoa into Adele goes by. Then we see more of the Blom tower and a clip of Renoa reaching for Squall on the parade floor, as we, as we said. There is an explosion... And we see the arch from Delling City under which Squall died. The camera takes us through the arch, and we're back in the ballroom for more blurred face action. There are a lot of images in this section, including Adia from the parade float, Ultimacia, Renoa in space, the eyes from all the cast members fading into each other, and probably a lot more than that. There is also a frame from the last moment of disc one, the image of Squall's eyes as he falls under the parade float. Renoa in space. <laughs> At this point in the movie, and for the last few minutes as well, Squall's life has literally been flashing before his eyes. Mostly, I think what he's saying is events in disc one. Uh, <laughs> well, that's his life, according to the theories. So. Right, according to the theory. Uh, I feel that there is a particular focus on the two main events of disc one. There you go. The final exam at Balam and the encounter with Adia on the parade float. But of course, the ballroom scene, which was of particular importance to Squall, is by far the most covered event in the first half of the ending FMV. However, as I've been mentioning through this section, there are also snippets of images from the latter half of the game, particularly Renoa in space. At the end of this part of the ending movie, we see Renoa coming towards the camera, arms open for an embrace. As before, the closer she gets, the more obscure she becomes. And then we see our final shot of Squall, which is Squall with his face just like gone. A big O. It looks like it looks like the spear hit him in the fucking head. There's <laughs> just a big hole where Squall's no. face is. Uh, if you've ever seen Gravity, it's when they see the other <laughs> the other astronaut. Yeah, she turns him over. There's a big hole in his face. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, so far, the best analysis I have for the screenshot is that Squall feels empty, and that he's losing a sense of self and everything that comes with him. He is having trouble visualizing his memories, or even remembering reality from fiction. Think back to what Ultimacia said at the end of the last battle. Reflect on your childhood, <laughs> your sensations, <laughs> your words, your emotions. <laughs> Time. It will not wait. No matter. How hard you hold on, it escapes you. His life is fading from him. You can't hold on forever. <laughs> there is one last shot of Renoa floating in space. The glass on her space helmet cracks and sends large pointed shards towards the camera. There is a sound like someone being struck by a sword. We cut to Squall, eyes wide, a tear escaping him. He throws back his head and is consumed by white. And now, finally... Squall is dead. We see a white feather fall to the ground, and the screen fades to black. The last ten minutes of the FF8 ending movie are, in the simplest terms, of heaven, or some equivalent thereof. You know, the, the last ten minutes of it is just like everything... Everything uh, ends up perfectly, you know? Yeah, the even, time... Even Cypher is just fishing. <laughs> yeah. So that's... That's interesting. I probably would have killed Cypher. I don't know. Like I'd be like, "Sorry, dude. You you fucked up." Too I much. can't. I can't allow you to live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we do have a rebuttal on this theory, and uh, this is from Final Fantasy Answers Wikia.com, and this is from Emperor Medius. It says, "Squall is dead, and why it doesn't work." So, um. Strange things are afoot, he says. And uh, I'm just going to list off some of the um, things that he, you know, he he's, he's against as, as far as the Squall is dead theory is concerned. Right. It says, Norg is mentioned in Balam Garden computers during disc one. 
Interesting. Therefore, it can't have been a f- fabricated by Squall's mind because Squall wasn't dead by this point. Mm-hmm. So. Moombas are shown to exist in flashbacks of Laguna's time. Laguna is Squall's father, so therefore he had to exist. And not just another... What? Mental fabrication. Mental fabrication. Okay. You okay there? Just it's fine. just I'm Having blind as fuck. <laughs> okay. Balam doesn't randomly fly. It was built on the central ruins. It's it's shown is Esther that levitating structures are a possibility. So why is Garden an exception? Uh, the orphanage was built. I'm not sure what he's referencing in the Squall's Dead theory. Um, the orphanage was built as a result of the aftermath from Adele's Sorcerer's War. All the orphans were gathered by Adia and Sid, and then they grew up. They were all transferred to Sims Belong Garden. It's not far-fetched if you pay attention. That's true. That is what the... It, the part that's far-fetched is that they don't fucking remember each other. It's not the orphanage itself. It's right. that they're all, oh, oh yeah, you were there. <laughs> like, how would you even remember now that they were there? Well, you know... Their, their small explanation for that is that the Guardian forces fuck with your memory and thus making a stupid plot twist right in the middle of the game. Yeah, that yeah. doesn't really mean anything. I'm like, okay, brush that aside. Let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he starts listing other ridiculous plot twists in, in the other Final Fantasy games. Uh, in Final Fantasy VII, it's revealed that Sephiroth has been incapacitated for the entire game and controls an extraterrestrial planet destroyer that he believes is his mother into summoning a giant meteor for him to cleanse the planet. Uh, Cecil is actually born from a race of people that live on the moon in Final Fantasy IV and doesn't know this for the entire game until he goes to the moon and meets Fusoya. True. In Final Fantasy IX, the god of death Necron comes out of nowhere and decides that because Kuja had a hissy fit, he's going to end all existence. He's not explained. He doesn't go on to do anything. He's just there. That does bug me about Final Fantasy IX. You know, the one in seven doesn't bother me at all because... We're, with the revelations of the spinoffs to seven, that's addressed to where... It's the other, you know, it's the Black Hoods. It's those dudes that Sephiroth is controlling. It's still addressed in Final Fantasy VII, but... It is. Uh, you know, you gotta look into it a yeah. little bit. No, I remember thinking... I remember I was having trouble with, with that whole thing. But yeah. something that I think lets me accept that plot twist better, and I say plot twist in quotes, is that you're discovering information about Sephiroth. You're, like, being a detective about it. And, uh... With the squall, with, with the you know everybody being related in the orphanage, they already had that information. And they just chose not to remember, and so as the audience were like, "Oh, they remembered. Oh, that's interesting. Okay." Yeah, it's kind of it's just dumb. Sorry, sorry. It really. is. So, what do you? Are we and gonna read some more of these? He's he's also explaining in other Final Fantasies that other people had ridiculous uh, mortal images I- I- injuries in the Final Fantasy series. Yeah. Cloud fallen like a million feet. Yeah. So in Final Fantasy IV, Rydia was eaten by Leviathan. Yang was caught in the middle of an explosion. Sid fell off an airship with a bomb strapped on, strapped to him. Fasoya and Golbez were both uh, hit by a powerful media spell. All of them survived. Here's the thing with uh, Final Fantasy IV. That is a problem me and Kayla both have with that game. Is that is that shit? Yeah. <laughs> that is a huge uh, problem. So I don't think it makes it okay for Final Fantasy VIII's plot twist to be dumb no we can't just accept no. more bullshit because of prior bullshit right. they're not connected so final fantasy 7 14 year old rookie grunt i'm not sure how old he is but whatever uh cloud strife was impaled by a first class soldier sephiroth in a similar fashion to Aerith, and was still able to lift sephiroth off the ground and throw him off into the reactor i just think that part's badass yeah so fuck it <laughs> yeah well plus you have such adrenaline rushing through you i mean it's not ridiculous necessarily and so here he is explaining squall and renoa's romance uh so what i understood is that people hate the romance storyline yet they think it moved too quickly what would you prefer sitting through a long and tedious dating game just so that the main character can end up in a relationship this is a video game remember it's not life Uh, this is all opinions here too uh let's take a look at cloud and Aerith, for example and so he does cloud and Aerith here and i'm just gonna skip that cloud and Aerith's romance is kind of iffy too so why should it have to drag out a romantic plot line just to make it more realistic? If I remember, Squalls only starts to realize his feelings for Renoa when she goes comatose. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but yeah. before that, he's distant <laughs> and cold to her. Um, the game is four discs long. The fourth disc makes 
is made up of a few bosses in the final dungeon, and then the final battle, and the ending. The first disc was an introduction where they established the characters' plot, locations, and background. That means that everything else has to fit in two discs. Naturally, they're not going to draw things out and act in real time. They need to speed things up. All the plot twists and story developments can happen at the start because, whatever, this is dumb. Uh, <laughs> clearly, because things move too fast for people must be a result of Squall being dead. Uh, what? Uh, yeah, when you think about it, Squall and Renoa's blossoming romance is a terrible excuse for the t Squall is dead theory. I do think that is a weak part of the Squall is dead theory, but I also don't think it's okay for them to have a weak relation, a, a relatively weak romance. I mean, it's still, as I said in our review episode, I think it's still a stronger romantic plot line than any other game that came before it, I think, that I know of. Yeah, that we know of. Yeah. So... You know, whatever. I mean, maybe s seven is really the only competition it has in that department. I think. Yeah. Um, people just seem to forget that this is a science fiction fantasy game. Uh, therefore, things are going to be odd. But people ignore all the unusual events that go on before Squall's death. Let me list a few. In the tomb of the Forgotten King, where you get the brothers GF, uh, you talk to a skeletal ghost of a long dead ruler who thanks you for freeing his soul. That is a really weird part. Uh, yeah. It's, I don't think it's mentioned on anything. Monsters roam wild and free despite normal animals being shown, such as deer, dogs, and monkeys. Everyone treats monsters as a common part of life. Ultimacia is shown to exist and therefore can be assumed that there is time travel... Tra time traveling witch possessing people with her mind many generations into the future the proof her quote at the festival shameless filthy wretches hailing the one whom you have condemned for generation what happened to the evil ruthless sorceress of your fantasies she stands before your eyes to become your new ruler and there are he's saying there's plenty of odd things happening before this too yeah and there are they're not I don't think they're quite as strange, but that does debunk it in a way. And Norg is mentioned if you do look on the, the computer in like the classroom. It mentions I, I that didn't they know built that, it. But yeah. Okay. Uh, this leads me to the second part. Squall is okay. So Squall is presumably dead. So why? So the camera that Selfie is using cuts out before Squall can be seen in the ending. That makes no sense whatsoever. And here's why: If Squall really wasn't there, how come Medea is shown back to be normal? It's interesting. Uh, why would Renoa be outside talking to nobody? And why is she pointing up at the sky? It makes no sense unless Squall is out there with her. If Squall were dead, why does it then show him outside with Renoa? By this point, we believe the dream world theory. If Squall would be dead as a door, would be dead as a doornail, there's no reason why he'd be outside staring up at the stars because he's dead and buried. His dream world can't exist if he's dead. True, and the... I don't think he read the last part of the. <laughs> Well, I don't know. The Squall's a, Dead theory where he's like, you know, some sort of heaven. Yeah, that's the only explanation. Right. And that does kind of counter the counter. <laughs> right. So, Schweiss, this episode is getting a little long. Um, but we are going to do a, a short question segment after this. We'll answer a couple of them, I think. All right. Um, but before we do that, Schweiss, do you think that Squall is dead the whole game? No. I think that it's just the, it's just the writing. <laughs> they they just left some big plot holes and no I don't and think so. And the dream, the time compression thing maybe looks like death. <laughs> yeah, it is bit. an interesting theory. I do enjoy theories like this, but I don't think it holds a ton of weight. I agree. It does. It does make if it were the case, more people would talk about it. I'm sure, and a lot of people would really, really love eight and be like you don't understand it. I don't ever see you don't understand eight. I see. I like eight. Eight is my favorite. Not eight is my favorite because the story is fucking awesome because you're dead the, for three of the four discs. You know, I feel like that would be a more powerful conversation piece. If that were the case, do you not? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think some of the plot was, as we've been discussing this, they, they, they're just it's just bad writing in in some sequ in some circumstances and certainly the romance should have been a little bit more well drawn out but you know what can we do yeah <laughs> i don't think swell's dead either i think there's there's not really enough solid evidence that squall is dead the only real evidence is that he was impaled yeah and it's and gone just forgets about that it that is the biggest supporting factor to this right. theory and it's it's pretty big 
but I'm not sure if it, anybody actually believes this theory. I think people just think it's an interesting theory. It is. I would agree. But all right, so Schweiss, we're gonna do a quick question segment, and uh, then we'll be done. Okay. All right. Let's do it. So, first up in the ultimate question segment. We'll call it the ultimate question segment. Well, it, it's our biggest... Should we start calling it the ultimate question segment? I don't know. Well, it's just the ultimate segment because okay. it's the most commonly used. All right. So, this comes Besides from... the news, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. The news. <laughs> well, if there is any freaking news. The thing is, is we get questions, but Square doesn't give us news. Yeah, there you go. So, this one comes from the forum, of course. It says, how do you feel about the rival... Quote, quote, podcast copying UFF now. Dun, dun, dun. What I feel more interesting is more interesting is that we are the opposite of FFU. We are them backwards. <laughs> like I, I didn't think about that. I was like, oh, we have the same letters. And then one day I was like, oh my god, it's the same. You Just... know, it's, there's a there's a Final Fantasy web call, website called Unofficial Final Fantasy, and they use the same exact uh, acronym as acronym us. As us. Damn yeah. it. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know that until we started this podcast. So, I'm well, that sorry. Sucks. I'm Hopefully. sorry, uh, unofficial Final Fantasy. Yeah, it's yeah. Ultima Final Fantasy now. <sighs> yeah, bitch. All right, so this comes from Shinru, a Knight of the Round. Dun, dun. Congrats, congrats. It comes from a Twitter post stating, going to try and complete a Final Fantasy per month. Happy 2015, winky face. So who's this uh, Twitter post from? Fosness. Fosness? Oh, God. Wait, who's Fosness? It's our close friend, Lauren. <laughs> We're very close. She's going to try to complete a Final Fantasy main series game every month now. She started with FF1 and GBA, and this is her New Year's resolution for 2015. The following sister rumors, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, so this comes from Shinru, following yeah. his rumor. I heard from some of their Patreon supporters and chat group that they have heard about UFF and are aware of the skit you guys did, but talked about it and decided it best to not acknowledge you guys unless done really vaguely. She apparently didn't like the skit. What? Oh, come on. What? I would love it. <laughs> yeah, you guys could make fun of us by just swearing a lot and fighting amongst <laughs> each other instead of just one or of long you. long moments of silence where I ask you a question. What do you think, Caleb? I have to think about it. Okay. I like to I like to think about it. You did ask me what do you think, not what do you say. If you said what do you say, maybe it'd be instant. I doubt it. But what do you say? Kid? I say that uh, it's time to read this. <laughs> okay. The way of the skit you guys did, but talked about it and decided it best to not acknowledge you guys and listen vaguely. Apparently didn't like the skit and noticed their listeners dropping sometime around August slash September. They still have a ton of listeners, but they do feel a bit threatened. And realize that you guys are offering something different and want to do the same thing but differently in hope of gaining those listeners back. Dun, dun. Along with a lot more. End of rumor. So, yeah. You guys think you have to you guys have to step up and uh compete with them. Think you can beat at least mm -hmm. one main FF game every month? Let the battle begin. See, FF7's there's part on. of me that thinks that uh Shinru is just trying to make us beat games faster by saying that. Yeah. We oh don't... yeah, Lauren's doing it once per month. Come yeah. on, guys. Lauren can do what she wants. I mean, I, I'm i okay with the once a month thing, but I don't have as many other things that I'm trying to do right now as Joe. Yeah. So I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to force him to do that. That's ridiculous. Especially oh, when we're we get gonna, to 12. We're going to give ourselves a, a one-month time period for 9, but everything yeah. through 13 or through 14, we're going to try to do everything in two months each. I'm going to have to... Start drinking heavily for twelve. I know I, I know I always defend it and like it a lot, but I liked it for the hundred and ninety five hours that I played it last. I don't know if I can do that again. <laughs> I've gotta go a lot faster. Yeah, we were going through before I put that list up, me and Caleb were going through the games and like okay, what are we gonna do in Final Fantasy ten? What are we gonna do in twelve and what are we gonna do in thirteen as far as extra stuff and so that we can plan that out. Yeah. And uh 
we're gonna do that with nine also. We're gonna have to meet up a lot and sit down and just like play these right. in the same area like we did with two. To one, blast two, and hit. three. Yeah, yeah, we did it with kinda three. Kind of hung out and, and, did, and did the games. Yeah, and we've been doing that with nine because I'm playing nine on the PSP. So yeah, this comes yeah. over and we chill. Uh, as far as our rival, in quotes, Final Fantasy podcast, believe me, our new rival is Limit Break Radio. <laughs> yeah. They shamelessly put us down on their show. <laughs> quote, in, quote, unquote, it wasn't really a competition. Yeah. We knew we were going to blow them away. End quote. Uh, so, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Look, I, I'm not sure if I believe the rumor thing where Lauren didn't like the skit and, you know, they're talking about how their uh, their listenership has dropped since, you know, we started getting a little bigger. Yeah. But um, we're still a very small podcast and we doubt that any noticeable listenership drop comes from us. Right. I know there are maybe half a dozen people that have said they've come over from um, Final Fantasy Union and now listen to us. Mm. But, uh, and even if we multiplied that by say 10 60 people that's not going to be like a disgusting drop for these guys they come out with an episode a month guys yeah they they wouldn't even know there's a drop until a month after and we in september honestly compared to now eh. we had a drop in september too yeah. i think it's just the time of year there was august was pretty high and then september dropped and then october was much higher but I don't know. I think it was October that was sucky because that was when we went to the convention and I was like super excited about it being like a good opportunity to meet people and and then October it October was whatever. All of our months except for like one month we've had gains. Yeah. So it's like their their drop in numbers has nothing to do with us. I, I promise you. Yeah, and I mean even you I mean I wish it I wish it did. Yeah, I wish we could honestly say that yeah, we're we're siphoning the life out of them. Yeah. I mean, that seems harsh, but I mean, even you said yourself that you kind of not really listen to them much anymore. Just like way... this show. Yeah, there's that. But I mean, you you listen to podcasts. Yeah, I do listen. And to you podcasts. did listen. And to I Union used to listen to them a lot, and yeah. I still am subscribed to them. And uh, you're an enabler, I guess. Maybe <laughs> I should stop. Uh, look, I'm gonna say this right now. Um, as they are not mentioning us in your rumor, uh, we will no longer mention Final Fantasy Union on this show. Yep. Or any other podcast until it comes to best of the year next year. Yeah, that's the only time we're going to mention them, and I'm okay with that. So we're so. done, unless they mention us, in which case we're on. Yeah, but the the problem <laughs> is, is we won't notice because I don't listen to podcasts, period, really, because I don't have time, which sucks because then that means I can't you know improve this one as much, but... And two, it's there's really no reason. I mean, what we'll else? We'll beat them eventually. Yeah, we've already Don't worry about we've it. already beaten beaten them into the ground as far as like our skit against Lauren and like all this <laughs> other shit that we've done. There's really nothing else that we can nitpick. Yeah. So, so they're cola right now, Coca Cola, and we are we are Pepsi. Oh, Coke is so much better to me. <laughs> I'm saying it in terms of size. Oh, oh. You know, we're the bad boys, right? Yeah. Yeah. Coke is so more bad. on the edge because yeah. it had cocaine. Well, maybe well, then. Old Coke. <laughs> we're old Coke. <laughs> <laughs> you just ruined my, my, um, you ruined my thing. Sorry. So, yeah. <sighs> yeah. No more, no more Union. <laughs> Only Ultima and probably we'll set our, we'll set our eyes on the, uh, Limit Break and <laughs> Limit Break's the Final Fantasy fourteen podcast. There's no way we're gonna get their listeners. Unless we did fourteen. But even then it would just be for those episodes, yeah. if anything. I'm, Plus, I don't I cool. don't feel in competition with Limit Break. No. One it's I'll like tell a... you who I feel in competition with. FXN and Ferricide Chats. For yeah. some fucking reason they're above us. I know, we dropped too. And sequence Strangely. break. Strangely. We're doing great and then we're like iTunes is like Meh. You yeah. don't need to be shown. I don't know. Maybe it just takes iTunes. Like, maybe it takes a lot of listeners. We maybe don't have that many listeners. Maybe it's the reviews. Maybe it is the reviews. Dun, we'll dun, put dun, a dun, review dun, dun. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate your uh, question. Yeah. Um, we got our second question here, and I think we're going to just end it with this second question. Sorry for all those who put up questions. We'll get to them next week. We'll have, a, I think, a shorter discussion next week. Yeah. Yeah, we don't well, have a novel oh, yeah. to read. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
This is physical versus digital part two. You remember our part one, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is from Gammon Stark, who's an Ultima weapon. Oh, man. Nice. Uh, said, inspired by the previous questions, which, uh, which about which you would rather own, uh, which format do you find yourselves forgetting about? Author Tracy Hickman mentioned in an interview that as we move into the age of digital media, it is good to have artifacts. Uh, both hosts, so me and you, Caleb, oh, sweet. Uh, <laughs> mentioned wanting to have physical copies of favorite games, and Hickman mentioned that he wanted to offer supporters a physical copy of the book he was kickstarting for the same reason. I type this while surrounded by shelves of such artifacts my favorite books over here my favorite games over there uh what does he say here suck it comma splice okay whatever his writing Uh, (laughs) he's a teacher so i look around the room and remember enjoying these items and that and what i was doing as i sorry this is hard for me to read right now and what i was doing as I was enjoying these items, but some of you, especially those of you who may be digital natives, may get the same feeling when you look at a list of games on whatever device you're using. So again, which format do you find yourself buying games in, but then promptly forgetting about or just sitting on? Uh, I tend to forget about digital media. I'm currently sitting on eight digital games and eight demos as well as five Kindle books. Okay, Joe, so how many games do you have on Steam? That like, you have not touched. Many. <laughs> do, you, do you know how many I have? Okay, on... in comparison to what I have, but I don't really buy many Steam games. You guys have bought more Steam games for me than you have bought. Than I have for bought you. for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and what's strange is the ones that we've bought for you, we've played more. I think. I think so too. <clears throat> well, since I mostly buy physical copies of games unless it's a computer game honestly uh those are going to be the ones that i that i probably play um and probably have more memories of i think is what he's like what what do we find ourselves forgetting about yeah which I think format definitely digital like there's some games on steam i've i've gotten that i haven't touched and uh, hopefully will someday, because, you know, I'd, I'd like to get to them, but there's a lot of Final Fantasy in the way. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is. Yeah, so, eh, probably, yeah, digital is more forgetful. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I have a lot of games on Steam. It's not nearly as many as Caleb Craig or, you know, our, one of our friends outside, Christian, who was doing the podcast, or not doing the podcast, doing the games with us. Until six, strangely enough, when he like just stopped playing, and I'm like, uh, yeah, lame. It's, it's an awesome game. But I have like eighty games, eighty, ninety games, and I think I've been like fifteen or twenty of them on Steam. And I know there's probably like seven other ones that I've beaten outside of Steam that I just pre-purchased as part of bundles and whatnot. But part of me knows that I should play them again because I bought them again, but I forget about them. I do. I'm in the same boat as Gammon with this. If I've got it as a physical copy, I'm more likely to play it. Although at the same time, I've owned, you know, Secret of Mana or whichever Mana game was on PS1. I can't remember which one it is. Uh, Legend of Mana. Legend of Mana. I bought it and I have not even touched it. Like I've opened it, looked at it, and I was like, oh, cool, it's in good condition. Shelf. <laughs> so it's kind of the same way with that. It's just I need to have a a motivation to play them, which I think is... You know, obviously the reason why we're doing this podcast is to play all the Final Fantasies. As we've mentioned, it's something that we wanted to it's do a goal, yes. for a long time. Yeah. Yes. And I think there has to be some sort of goal in order to play, especially a series of games. Right. And when I played the Bioshock games, I've been playing those since we started the podcast. And I finished uh, Bioshock Infinite, like, maybe two weeks ago. So I played all three of them on, on Steam. So it just kind of depends, but... Huh. Yeah. I don't know. I, most everything I buy is physical, with the exception of a few Steam games, and I bought rebought the Final Fantasies on other platforms. Yeah. Um, simply because of ease of playability. <laughs> Isn't it weird, though, that we want physical copies of games that are not on PC, but PC, we just like don't give a shit? The only reason I don't give a shit is because hardly anyone sells PC games anymore. 
Yeah. You remember when you could go into a GameStop and there was a PC section? I do. There's like nothing in the PC. It's like tiny as hell. And even what's yeah. there is like downloadable from the site. It's so you might as well just buy them. Steam just made it. Yeah. It created it that way. Plus the, the artwork and stuff in these older games, especially like PS2, PS1, having the booklet and everything in there, it's just cool. And I like the way it looks. Yeah. And with PC games, a lot of times you get that shitty little you know cardboard deal like the nintendo games used to come in and they're just like gone immediately and no one remembers what the hell they look like it's just the disc <laughs> yeah or the cartridge cartridge so. i think that's part of it too it's it's more you know it looks better than yeah my Battlefield i like to 3. have it up on a shelf yeah so i don't know yeah there's just some there's a charm about physical stuff mm-hmm. that uh i prefer same with books for me too I would rather have a physical book than a... I have bought one Kindle book ever, and it was for a class. Oh, yeah. I rented a textbook. That's the only thing I've ever bought. I had free downloads for Amazon Prime or whatever, but other than that, nothing. Did you read it? Read the Amazon Prime stuff? Yeah, I read a book. Okay. I read uh, Slaughterhouse 9. Or 5. Is it 5? Slaughterhouse 5. 5, 9, yeah. It was really good. (laughs) It was awesome. They're just numbers. Yeah. It's a number in between five and nine. (laughs) All right. Well, that's going to end it for this episode. We will get to to more questions next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about the Renoa is Ultimacia theory and whatever else may come up. We're not going to be reading a giant theory like we did this week. No, Um, it's not as huge. It's not as huge. (laughs) Yeah, it's not as huge. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave you. Mm -hmm. See you guys next week. See you next week. Enjoy the grind. This has been another production of Ultima Final Fantasy, the ultimate Final Fantasy podcast. The show was produced by Joseph de Gaulier and Caleb Schweiss with music and editing by Joseph de Gaulier, parodies and clips from their respective authors, of course. You can get all of our episodes as well as our Let's Plays at ultimafinalfantasy.com. You can also contact us on Twitter at UFF Podcast as well as our contact page on our website. Be sure to subscribe and review our podcast. Your reviews may get read on the show. And look forward to the next episode of Ultima Final Fantasy, the ultimate Final Fantasy podcast.